can tell a couple's married when they do a lot of things together, they have fun. If they were like holding hands, being happy. I like it when my daddy gives my mom. Sometimes they go to different restaurants and like have dates and everything. They are caring for each other. I always see them smiling at each other and talking at each other and that's how I know they're boyfriend and girlfriend. When someone falls in love, it's probably like they get a little shaky, sweaty, nervous, and they don't know what to do. They um, bumped into each other. They started talking and they'd never met before, and so they got engaged one day and then they married. Like you have a ring in the case and then you like put your knee down. He would pick a table outside, it was um, private for us, and then he would get down on one knee, lift the wing up, and I really hope it has a diamond on it. All rings need a diamond, everybody. That's a fact. A romantic proposal, like on a mountain or something like that, while skydiving. The husband's job is to make sure everything's okay. He gets some furniture in. He's the strong one. He sometimes takes care of the house a little bit for her. Try to make the wife happy. A wife's job is, um, I don't know. Make sure everything stays in order. To wash the dishes sometimes. Gives him a hug and asks him, how was your day? They have to make dinner and everything. They have to do some laundry while the dad is just chilling on the couch. I'll probably get married when I'm 30 because 20 is way too young. I am definitely gonna get married. I know who it is. Abby Patty. No! Oh. Mm, I don't want to. I would get married with a unicorn because it's unicorns are cute and they're fluffy. I want to be engaged to someone I know I can like, I know I, I can love, I know um, I trust these, this person, I know that my heart picks him and my um, brain has to pick him too. When I get married, I hope I have a wife that loves Jesus and she prays with me, she helps me struggle through hard things, and we're just a great couple. I would hope to be married to someone that is very, very happy, who is always optimistic and has a lot of fun doing simple things. He just loves you for who you are, and I love him for who he is. Every boy wants that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> After last week's lead-in video, I thought we probably needed something a little bit lighter, so um, it made me laugh. But there's some good biblical principles there. Did you hear the boy who said he wanted a wife who loved Jesus, who would pray with him and help him struggle through hard things? That's a biblical marriage. That's something that we should all aspire to. Last week, we dug into the theology of marriage. We talked about um, God's ideal for marriage in Genesis chapter 2, that two would become one. And we talked about why this oneness was important, because we started as one, because it's as one that we best reflect together, male and female, the image of God that we were created in. And that God gave us good work to do that we could only accomplish together. Uh, we talked about what biblical oneness looks like. Uh, a husband and wife pursuing what God has set before them together. Living in humility and actively choosing to be unselfish. Putting their relationship with their spouse above all other relationships. We talked about how we as a fallen people can best achieve this type of oneness, how it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about how we must act love even when we don't feel love, rejoicing in the truth of who our spouse is in Christ, choosing to see them as God sees them and not as Satan wants us to see them, and how we are to commit to marriage as a covenant and not a contract irrevocable regardless of the circumstances. Today we're going to get a little bit more practical. It will be less theology and more real life application. Today we're going to dig in to the most important thing that you can do to move from you and me 
into we. The number one way to pursue oneness in your marriage is to pray together every day. A study done at the University of Texas in 2010 found that while 50% of first marriages end in divorce and 78% of second marriages end in divorce, less than 1% of couples who pray together every day end their marriage. The study followed 1,000 156 couples who prayed together daily, and out of all of those couples, over a thousand, only one divorced. That is 0.00087, or 0.087%. That alone should convince you of the power of prayer in marriage. I tried to end there this morning, and they wouldn't let me. Kathy Keller Pastor, uh, the wife of Pastor Tim Keller, in a particularly hard season for them, explained to her husband why it was so important to her that they pray together every day using this illustration. She said, imagine you were diagnosed with such a lethal condition that the doctor told you you would die within hours unless you took this particular medication. One pill taken every night would keep you alive. Miss that pill even once, and you would die. Would you forget? Would you just not get around to it some nights? Of course not. You would never forget. You would never miss. She went on to tell him, if we don't start praying together every night, We are not going to make it with all that we're facing right now. I'm not. We have to pray. We can't let it slip our minds. That was in 2002. As of 2014, when Keller published his book on prayer, they had not missed a night of praying together. Even if it meant him calling her on the phone because they were apart for the night. I share this with you for a couple of reasons. One, it's a great illustration of how important praying together in marriage is. And two, because if the Kellers struggled with this, it's okay if we struggle with it too. This was in 2002. Tim Keller started his church in New York in 1989. It took them decades to figure out exactly how important prayer in marriage was and how to make it work in their marriage. Before we dig into some specifics on prayer in marriage, I think we should pray. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I praise your holy name. Lord, it is our joy to come before you in prayer to speak to you as a father and as a friend. Lord, I humbly ask that these words you've given me are your words, that you, that what you have to say here would be heard, that ears would be open, hearts would be changed, and marriages would be transformed. Holy Spirit, come, settle over us and teach us In the name of Jesus Christ, your son, amen. You have um, a life at Colonial that looks a little bit different during our series, but there's a spot in the middle to take some notes. So our rough outline today is we're going to touch briefly on prayer in general for our younger audience members, for those who aren't yet in the habit of a regular and consistent prayer life. And there's no judgment. God loves you right where you are. He just doesn't want you to stay there. And every one of us can improve our prayer life in one way or another. So that's where we're going to start. We'll then spend some time talking about how you can pray best for your spouse in your marriage individually and how powerful that can be. To those here today who aren't married, this can truly be applied to any relationship that you have. What we cover today is beneficial to everybody regardless of your marital status. So so stick with me. 
And finally, we'll dig into the heart of the matter, praying together. It is my prayer that everybody will learn something that they can apply today, that they will be inspired or perhaps even convicted to change something in their prayer life. Prayer, as the kids said today, is talking to God. It's a conversation, an encounter with the one that, who created us. And while you can't call God on the telephone or shoot him a text, you can talk to him anytime you want, just like you would a friend. Could you imagine having a best friend or any relationship that you never talked to them? Of course not. Prayer is how we build relationship, how we strengthen relationship with God. It's how we seek him out and ask him to direct us. God promises us in the book of Jeremiah that if we seek him out, we will find him. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. Prayer is how we seek God. It's how we connect with God at a heart level. And it leads to a self-knowledge, a self-understanding that we can't achieve any other way. In prayer, you are with God. The one who knows you better than you know yourself. You can't hide anything from God. Before him, you will undoubtedly see yourself in a new light. As Tim Keller puts it, it's the way we know God, the, the way we finally treat God as God. Prayer is simply the key to everything we need to do and be in life, regardless of your age, your life circumstance, or, or where you are in your spiritual walk. Prayer is essential. Prayer is how we experience deep change. The benefits of a consistent prayer life, both spiritual and physical, are limitless. It brings us closer to God. It gives us spiritual direction and invites God into our daily lives. This helps minimize our wrong decisions by sharpening our discernment. Prayer increases our spiritual strength. It manifests peacefulness. It produces confidence. It gives us energy and inspires hope. It helps limit distractions in our life. It protects us from discouragement and increases our spiritual fruit. Prayer changes us. It, it changes our attitudes. It has the ability to eliminate anxiety and worry. It softens our heart towards others, and it helps keep our selfishness in check. It is the way in which we ask for forgiveness and receive grace. It is essential to our spiritual life. Prayer is powerful. And there are primarily two ways that prayer can influence and impact your marriage. One, the individual prayers that a husband or a wife pray over their spouse and over their marriage. And two, the prayers they pray together. Scripture tells us that Christ intercedes on behalf of his church. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, the one who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, Romans 8, 34. And we learned last week, right, that, that we are to love our spouse as Christ loved the church. If Christ intercedes for his church, then we have to intercede for our spouse. In your individual prayer time, pray for your spouse Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. And if you're not married, pray for the significant relationship in your life. Parents, pray for your kids. Kids, pray for your parents. 
Pray for your siblings. And, and before you complain about that, Jesus also tells you to pray for your enemies. So it doesn't really matter what you think about your sibling, you're supposed to pray for him. <laughs> for those of you who already consistently pray for your marriage, I applaud you. You are light years above so many couples. For those of you who struggle in this area, it's totally okay. We're going to walk through some really simple Yet powerful prayers you can pray over your spouse. And I'm not trying to talk down to anybody or insult you if you already do this. Most of these prayers, I'm just learning to pray over Eric. There are things that that I didn't even think to pray over him until I took a marriage class in seminary. The first thing to pray for with your spouse is to thank God for them. Scripture reminds us to be thankful in our prayers. Even when we are frustrated with our spouse, thank God for them. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's been a lot of research in the past few years on thankfulness or gratitude, as social scientists call it. Being grateful and expressing your gratefulness has proven to be associated with all sorts of positive impacts. It gives you a greater sense of well-being. It increases your willingness to help others. It broadens your ability to cope creatively with life's challenges and and directly improves your relationship with others. Once again, research proves Scripture correct. Pray for God to bless your spouse, not to change your spouse. It's appropriate to pray for change in your marriage, but probably not the way you're hoping to. We'll we'll get to that in a little bit. For now, pray for God to bless your spouse. Aaron, Moses' priestly brother, modeled this for us in Numbers chapter 6 when he prayed for the Lord to bless and keep the people of Israel. Pray for God to turn his face toward your spouse, to be gracious to them, and to give them peace. Pray for wisdom for both you and your spouse. James 1.5 encourages us to ask for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given to him. Pray for all the specific things you want for your spouse. Pray for them to have a closer relationship with God. A hunger and longing for God's word in their heart. That they would hate sin and love truth. Pray against temptation they might face. And protection from the enemy. Pray for them to be a good spouse. A good parent. A good friend. A good worker. Pray that they would be a good steward of the resources God's given them. There's a list of of some examples of ways that you can pray for your spouse on your insert along with scripture references. It is powerful to pray scripture over your spouse. But these are just examples. Make it your own. Pray your desires and your hopes over your spouse. And for those who aren't married, they are beautiful prayers to pray over anyone, family, friends, any significant person in your life, a future spouse that you haven't even met yet. In your individual prayer time, pray for your spouse and pray for yourself as a spouse. Pray that God would make you aware of the ways you negatively impact your marriage. Much like David did in Psalm 139, 23 through 24, he prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you ask God to show you where and how you're being a doofus in your marriage, and that is the theological term, I'm pretty sure, He will absolutely show you. Don't pray for God to reveal your spouse's errors to you. You know those. You're keeping a list. 
Pray for God to reveal your errors, your mistakes, and pray for God to change you. That's the change you pray for in your marriage. That's how you ask God to change your marriage, change you. In your individual prayer time, pray for your spouse, pray for yourself as a spouse, and pray for your marriage. Praying daily for your marriage allows God to take lead in your marriage. Pray against temptation for both of you. Just as Jesus taught us to in Matthew 6, 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray against sexual temptation for both of you. Pray against anything that might distract either of you from God or your marriage. Hobbies work, kids and their activities, while good, are distractions. Pray for God to, have a, to give them a proper place in your life. Pray for forgiveness to be present in your marriage. Ask for forgiveness for the things that you have done wrong and ask God to help you grant forgiveness. I know you have an endless list of things. We just talked about that list you're keeping of your spouse's errors. The thing is, their list is just as long. Some things, though hurtful, are relatively minor. Being messy, consistently running late, loading the dishwasher incorrectly because there's a right way to load a dishwasher, are relatively easy things to forgive. But sometimes the things we need to forgive in our marriage are much more serious. Affairs, emotional or physical. Serious misuse of the family finances. Neglect. Abuse. In these circumstances, forgiveness is hard. And it takes a lot of prayer. And understanding what forgiveness is and what it isn't is really important. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, the meaning of forgiveness is to give up resentment or the desire to punish. To give up claim to punish or to exact penalty. To cancel or remit a debt. Essentially, forgiveness is giving up your right to get back at the one who has hurt you to make them understand how much they have hurt you or to make them make it up to you. Forgiveness does not mean you forget, but it does mean you stop bringing up past hurts. You don't hold past mistakes over your spouse. Forgiveness does not mean the other, the offender is off the hook. There are natural consequences to sin. And although forgiveness does mean that you don't look for or seek out retribution, there are times when the offender must accept the consequences of their actions and make amends for the damage that they've caused. It takes time and hard work to rebuild trust once it's been violated. Like love, forgiveness is an action and not a feeling. You don't wait to feel like forgiving somebody. We forgive because we are commanded to. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive, Colossians 3.13. Pray for forgiveness to be present in your marriage. Praying for yourself, praying for your spouse, yourself as a spouse, and your marriage on a daily basis is powerful and it absolutely can change your marriage. But the true power comes when you pray together. Author Stormy O'Martin argues, the strength of a man and a woman joined together in God's sight is far greater than the sum of the strengths of each of the two individuals. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Praying together is powerful. 
but it isn't always easy. According to a 2014 report by the Pew Research Center, more than half of Americans, 55%, pray every day. Only 4% of Christian couples pray together every day. If you look specifically at pastoral couples, this number skyrockets to 6%. (laughs) On behalf of pastors everywhere, I'm sorry. We have to do better. We need to set a better example for you. There's a reason only 4% of Christian couples pray together. If it isn't part of your regular prayer practice, it can feel awkward. It can be a little frustrating even at times. And you will absolutely be tempted to stop after just a few attempts. But don't. Persevere. It gets easier. It gets more comfortable. It gets more natural. If you continue on and you push past the awkwardness, there will come a time when it feels like the most natural And the most intimate thing you can do with your spouse. In his book, Lasting Promise by Scott Stanley, it didn't make you resourceless, but it is a wonderful book. I highly recommend it, Lasting Promise. Stanley compares prayer and marriage to the Israelites entering the promised land. You remember this story. Moses sends 12 spies out into the promised land to check it out. And they come back with rave reviews. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. This is, there's promise of prosperity to anybody who lives there. Yet when asked if they should go in, 10 out of the 12 said no. No, it's too hard. Those people there are really big, really tough. It's a little too intimidating you know what, let's just stay here. Let's just stay on this side. And we'll be safe. We'll be content. We can be satisfied. But God had promised them better. That's how it is in our marriages. We are given a promised land. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. A a land of promise of prosperity in your marriage. But so many of us say no. No, that seems too hard. We're fine where we are. We're content. We're good. But God's offering you so much more. Maybe we don't believe it's truly that great. Maybe we're afraid we can't live up to what's being asked of us. Maybe we're afraid our true vulnerabilities will show. After decades of counseling, clinical psychologist Barry Hamm suggests that people, both men and women, essentially desire two things. They want to be fully known and they want to be fully loved. Taken separately, each of these are easy to find. The rub is that we all want both. We want to be fully known and fully loved. To be fully fully known means that you risk being rejected. You show all your vulnerabilities. You lay it all out on the table. Your imperfections, your mistakes, Your sins, you lay it all out there. To be fully loved in spite of being fully known, that is a treasure beyond words. When a couple prays together, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt they are fully known and still fully loved by God and by their spouse. When we pray with our spouse, we lay out our vulnerabilities. We allow them to pray over us. We share and admit the areas in our life that we need prayer for. It's humbling. 
And it shows them who we really are. There's an intimacy in that that you won't find any other way. And don't forget the connection that happens when you pray over somebody. When we pray for someone, we begin to see them as God sees them. And we begin to love them as God loves them. Praying with your spouse gives you the opportunity to fully know them and to fully love them. Research proves this to be true. Numerous studies have shown that praying together as a husband and wife increases intimacy, transparency, and closeness to both God and to each other. It decreases conflict and anxiety and the risk of divorce. There's an increase in protection from spiritual forces. Satan wants nothing more than for your marriage to be divided. His goal in every marriage is to weaken, divide, and destroy. And he does it in some very sneaky ways. I remember standing in our kitchen. This is off script, so I'm sorry if I cry. I remember standing in our kitchen right before seminary. Eric and I were standing there. I could tell you where he was standing, where I was standing. And I looked at him and I said, if we're going to do this, if we're going to do seminary, we need to be ready because Satan's going to attack. And four years later, he did. Not in any um, obnoxious or, or powerful or obvious way. He was sneaky. He used four years of seminary to distract me and traveling work to distract Eric and and three busy kids and their schedules to distract us from each other and to weaken our relationship. And then he set before us a decision he knew we were divided on, a decision he knew we wouldn't agree on. And sure enough, it was the biggest fight of our marriage, year four of seminary. And I can remember thinking, We're in seminary. We're not supposed to fight like this. And so we started pursuing oneness, reconnecting, rededicating ourselves to each other. And what frustrated Satan beyond all end is that that's where my passion for marriage ministry was born. That's the reason that I stand before you today and say we can do better as a church to make sure that you guys have the marriage you deserve But he was sneaky. One of my favorite examples of the power of prayer in marriage comes from my friends Mitch and Suzanne Rice. This is a couple who absolutely gets it. But don't just listen to me. Check it out for yourself. We're Mitch and Suzanne Rice. (laughs) You said beat start. Okay. Hi, we're Mitch and Suzanne Rice, and we've been married 15 years uh, this this summer, and uh... (laughs) And I'll take over. (laughs) Um, Yeah, we just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how prayer has impacted our marriage. For the first 10, 12 years of our marriage, things were great, just really busy, and as we started family, busy with work busy with the kids, you know, things uh, got complicated. complicated, yeah, so we uh, we really hit a rough spot probably just three years ago, um, and we talked about it, really decided that we both felt led to really start praying together daily, and so that, that, that was remarkable, really, I mean, it was a little... It was a little awkward at first. It's not something we really did a lot of, but once we really started praying together, um, you know, things changed. We we really reconnected um, spiritually, emotionally. You know, it was really impactful on our marriage, and uh, that's what we credit for what we have now. Yeah, and I would say, yeah, it was Mitch would initiate that prayer, and you know, it was and um, I really appreciated it and then we got into the rhythm of it and as life threw curveballs um, just 
kids and complications or um, illness, um, just certain stressors that we were trying to navigate. Um, you know, we just are our go-to is prayer. And even when um, he's not home or I'm not home and we've missed a prayer for a day, he'll call and we'll pray over the phone. Yeah. Um, and that just kind of kind of sets us straight. And even um, how God has restored our marriage in this as connecting spiritually um, has been profound. Um, I lost my mom in March and... Um, our first go-to when we got the news, we were in a brewery in Marco Island, Florida, <laughs> and um, the first thing he did was pull me aside in the middle of the brewery and prayed with me, and um, it was it was amazing. It was calming. It was you know everything that it needed to be, and um, it was just it's been a beautiful a beautiful right. walk. Yeah. So, husbands, I would just like to encourage you to really take the lead on this and. Be intentional with it and really pray with your wife, uh, pray for her, pray for your family, um, and just make it something you do together daily, and um, you'll be amazed like we were at, at, at how things can change, how things can be restored and healed. The Rice's marriage is not perfect. They are two imperfect people who are trying really hard to love each other well. And one of the keys to their marriage is, is that they pray together every single day, and it has absolutely changed their marriage. Regardless of how good or, or, or not good your marriage might be, whatever is going on in your marriage, one, God can redeem it. He will use wherever you are right now for his glory. If you are interested in taking that next step in your marriage, I invite you to re-engage. It's launching August 19th, Sunday evenings, 5.30 to 7.30, right here at this campus. It is the best thing you can do for your marriage. So I hope that you will join us. Go to colonialkc.org slash events, and you can find all the information you need there. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the example that the Rices give to us. I thank you for the power of prayer that you model for us all throughout Scripture. Lord, I pray that, that your words would be felt here today, that, that as we would go from this place, we would remember this call to, to pray, that there is a, a promised land in our marriage that we can get to if we're willing to do the work for it. It is in the name of your son that we pray. Amen.